We are up to Hebrews chapter 11, that great heroes of faith chapter. And we're going to look at a few of the characters in there. We're going to take basically three weeks to go through this chapter. <coughs> and looking at faith, the difference between faith and true faith or saving faith. Um, the beauty of the gospel message is that it is so extremely simple that a small child can understand it. At the same time, it is so extremely profound and deep that there is no end to the knowledge and the learning that we can have. So it's both at the same time. So looking at chapter 11, verse 1, and breaking it up into three different parts, the overly simplistic. Faith, now faith is a chair sat in. It's that simple. But it's not the chair. It's the fact that we sat in the chair. It's the fact that we have faith that when we sit in the chair, it ain't gonna collapse. That's faith. It's that simple. It's not this big far-fetched thing that we nobody can grasp. It's that simple. And then, next part of that verse is, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Or the paycheck will come. Okay, the assurance, we have assurance that that paycheck is going to come. And now, we don't have the same assurance that we do with the things of God. But we have, we, very few of us spend a whole lot of time worrying about, and when we work for a week, we work for somebody that the paycheck isn't going to arrive and all of a sudden it's just going to stop. No, we feel pretty confident that it will continue. And then continuing with verse 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Because we get the paycheck, whether we get a check or direct deposit, the, the bank account increases. So it's, again, the conviction of things not seen. We didn't see it being done, but we're convicted it's going to happen. Do you see how simple it is, this concept of faith? But there's so much more, and there's so much to look at. True saving faith. Now, it is based upon that same faith, but true saving faith, and Heidelberg Catechism does a really good job with question and answer number one. What is your only comfort in life and death? that I am not my own, but belong body and soul to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, and earnestly desire to live for Him. If this part is true in our lives, we have saving faith. Simple little line. It's so simple, but it's also so deep, and so profound. Verse 2. For by it, men of old gained approval. Faith is a huge deal throughout all of Scripture. Because without faith, there is nothing. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credit to him as righteousness. Now, his faith works. <laughs> his faith works. Yeah, faith does work. It's, yeah, it is. Here again. Abraham believed God, and we're going to look a little bit more at Abraham a little further down, but the fact that he believed, that in turn made him justified. But it's like by grace, we've been saved through faith. Faith is what brings it about. Grace is what allows it to happen. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what was seen was not made out of things which are visible. In other words, all of creation, the earth, the stars, the other planets, the solar systems, were all created out of nothing. There was nothing there. It wasn't constructed. It was created. There's a big difference. 
And this is things we must believe. This, this, this is, goes back to our foundational faith. And in Psalm 146, it says, How blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and who keeps faith forever. Do we ever think of God's faith? See, he's faithful forever. There is no unfaithfulness in him. It's one of those things that we never give a thought to. God's faithfulness is permanent. It's not wavering. It gives us an example of how we should strive for. In Psalm 104, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing to my God while I have my being. In other words, this is our response. Our response to who this great God is. Verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, though which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts. And through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Because of what the men of old, the, we, see, we can go back to our church fathers, and we can go back to the ancients, and we can see what happened in their lives, and we can see the outcome of that faith. Are we establishing that for generations following us so that while we are once we are called home do we still have a testimony or are we going to be forgotten are we going to do so little in this life that nobody will remember oh yeah I, I kind of remember that person I really don't know much of anything about him you know I remember that person and there was all these things they did. They had something special about them. There was something different about them. That doesn't just happen. That has a big impact on how we live our lives and the things that we do, the way that we act. Now we're going to kind of veer off a little bit, but it all ties in. And this is getting back into the begets. The begets are fascinating when you study them. No, actually, we're going to do the Genesis. Okay. Yeah. Um, like we were talking the other day about, um, you know, I, I had mentioned to you all about, um, you know, if there's some particular book or theme or whatever you'd like me to go to next, say so. And I, and I told Debbie, I said, hopefully nobody comes up with Leviticus. No. <laughs> it's... <laughs> Uh, but um, it's probably the only one that I have not really delved into, uh, and there's a lot there. But anyway, um, get way off subject here. In Genesis 5, and this is kind of picking up, and we're going to go through, and, th and this demonstrates the faithfulness of God in a way that we normally don't see it. <laughs> Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. Then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah. Now there's an interesting little thing that can easily be missed in this little line. Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. Not necessarily. The first one that got mentioned. <laughs> okay, but if you look, it says, then Enoch walked with God. And if you look at the way that that wording is structured and you look at other parts, other scriptures, it is the beginning of his walk with God. Right. You know, it's one of those really easy things to just kind of slide by. You don't, you don't catch it. And he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. There's a kind of another little illustration of this walk, and it talks about uh, priests and the ones that are called by God, you might say, to preach, to prophesy. And it, in Zechariah, you have that last, the dust of the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways. Enoch walked with God. It wasn't that he was just the way they went in the woods a lot of times and walked together. No, he walked in the ways. And we also learn a little bit more about Enoch here in a little bit. But continuing on the way that God works and seeing things that we normally would miss. 
Methuselah lived 187 years and became the father of Lamech. Then Methuselah lived 700 years. You see, it was then he lived. It using the same words, but also but also not putting in this walked with God. Then Methuselah lived 782 years after he became the father of Lamech, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. If you follow biblical chronology from creation up until this point before the flood, and you follow the years, and the year that the flood came, Lamech dies five years before the flood. He actually dies before his father. Okay? Methuselah died the same year as the flood. Now that doesn't automatically say that he died in the flood. But it's just interesting, the same year of the flood, Methuselah died. And that was the grandfather of Noah and the son of Enoch. Here again, there is a faithfulness of our God to where he had made a promise to Adam and Eve about the coming of Christ and that he was going to carry this through. The world had gotten to such a point of sinfulness that God decided to destroy it. You have Enoch who walks with God. Okay, he's the great grandfather of Noah, but he died before Noah was born. Here again, you follow the chronologies. His son dies the year of the flood. His grandson dies five years before the flood with no mention of them actually walking with the Lord. The earth was so corrupt that God decided to destroy it. Now here again, people don't do it except for strange people like me. And you sit down and do the math about what was the population of the earth at that point. Now, we don't know exactly, but you can do simple math as far as the length of years that people lived, how many children they would logically have, and it becomes a guess, I understand that. But a person that lives 900 years having 65 kids wouldn't be strange. Wouldn't be strange, right? I mean, that's pretty logical. 900 years, that's probably even a low number. Do you know that they used that formula? By the time of the flood, there was a billion people on Earth. There could have easily have been a billion people on earth. And out of that billion people, there's no eight. Uh -huh. okay. This is how evil the world had gotten, but this is the faithfulness of God to his promise. That even though there was a point in time, a point in history, in which we have no indication that there was a single faithful person on earth. But do you see the faithfulness of our God? That he in the midst, no matter what man tries to do, no matter how evil man comes, God wins. His plans are not thwarted. Things do not happen because, oh boy, I really didn't see that coming. Like I said, these things are just little tidbits that you can draw out that give you a perspective that you really don't see when you just read the begets. Yeah, there, there is absolutely no indication. I mean, like I said, I don't know. It's not like I have this as hard facts, but using common sense and logic and, and wording of scripture. Wording of scripture is very, very important. Lamech lived 182 years and became the father of a son. Now listen to what Lamech says and based upon what we just talked about. Now he called his name Noah. <laughs> so there, the answer to that question. This one will give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. You see, there is no mention of we are getting what we deserve. It's God has made it really, really rough on us. And maybe this son will give us rest from this. Maybe there's something special about him. It's like he doesn't understand. You're going to get rest from your work, yes. Because the earth is about to be destroyed. Now it's 500 years later. Or actually 480, but... Um, 
Then Lamech lived 595 years after he became the father of Noah, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And here again, because you can take that and you can go back and see that he actually died before his father, Methuselah. By faith, verse 5, back in Hebrews, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before being taken up, he was pleasing to God. He didn't die. So the oldest man that ever lived died before his father. And then we learn a little bit more about him in the book of Jude. Okay, which is the second to the last book. <laughs> Yep, it's one chapter. It's the second to the last book of the Bible. It's just before Revelation. It was also about these men that Enoch, the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, so he was a prophet. Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of their ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now well, that's a pretty strong condemnation. The fact that he had prophesied and he had told the people in verse 6, and without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. This is like what was brought up before about anybody can pray. No, you can't. Unless you believe in the one you're praying to, you can't be praying. Okay, we cannot say that we believe and not act as though we believe. Because faith requires action. We have faith in the chair. We're not demonstrating that faith in the chair unless we sit in it. Remember how simple that faith was? But it still requires us to sit in it to demonstrate that the faith is real. Back to Genesis. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not strive with man forever, because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. Now this is another one of those that people fail to understand what it says. People think that means that people should live 120 years old. That's not what it says whatsoever. No, actually what it's talking about is from the time that this proclamation was made by Noah, the flood would be in 120 years. And that's like I said, this is another one of those little things that most people really miss. So we talked about Enoch prophesying and preaching for 300 years with no converts. Noah preached for 120 years that a flood was coming. Yep. That was it. But God in his faithfulness preserved that seed that he promised to Adam and Eve. He preserved that because of his faithfulness. Genesis 7. Now Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters came upon the earth. You're right. There, there is no indication whatsoever that, you might say, these sons, other than obeying their father and the wives obeying their husbands. Um, oh, no, he did that to himself. No, they didn't. No, they, no, that's which is another story. But no, he did that to himself. <clears throat> so he planted a he planted a vineyard and made wine and got drunk on the wine and and then you see the curse of Cain, which was the son. But anyway, that that's a whole other area in and of itself. But no, Noah did that to himself, and the um, the Christ comes through the lineage of Shem, not Ham and Japheth. Okay. Japheth is, as a matter of fact, our forefather. We didn't know that. Now Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth. Verse 7a is interesting because by faith, Noah being warned by God about things not seen. Yeah, rain. Because in Genesis 2, 6, but a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole ground. Genesis 2, verse 6. The mist. Right, that's, that's in Hebrews um, 7. 
Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11 verse 7. That should be in your bulletin. Um, I try to always put these all in there so that you can always go back and double check, make sure that I'm not messing up. Um, I, I like to be held accountable. Genesis 7 verse 6 was the age of Noah when the flood came. Hebrews 11 verse 7 is about being warned about things not yet seen. And then verse 7b, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. The faith that Noah demonstrated to build a big boat because he said there's a flood coming for 120 years and you could imagine the mocking that would have taken place yeah <laughs> yes and absolutely nobody believing of course until God shut the door and that had to have a major impact on the three sons when they saw there, there was no more denying who this God is and that we better pay attention <clears throat> back in Genesis now the Lord said to Abram go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and so that you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed so Abraham went forth as the Lord had spoken to him and then back into Hebrews verse 8 by faith Abraham when was called obeyed by going out to a place in which he was receiving an inheritance and he went out not knowing where he was going and if we go back and we take a look at Abraham when he was called he was Abram not Abraham did you know that from all indications he also was a pagan? He was a worshiper of foreign gods. He carried idols when he was called. And names had a much bigger meaning than, than they do now. Um, it was more of who you are than what you're called. See, here's what you're called. Then it was who you are. Um, and that's where you might say the last names. You might say if you go back into your family histories, you will find that there is a correlation between who the person was or where they lived or what they did in relation to their last name. And that was all put into place by Napoleon. Napoleon. Right, he's the one that instituted the last name concept because there were too many Johns that owed taxes. So anyway, another little side note. By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. See, Abram lived this whole time being promised, but never inheriting this promise. And it's almost like God's failing here, because he was called to go to a place. He gets there, and he doesn't get it. It's not his. He never actually owns any part of it. And we'll see because in verse 10 it explains that for he was looking for a city which has foundations whose architect and builder is God he wasn't looking for a piece of dirt he was looking for a place in heaven he was looking for a fellowship with God himself not a chunk of land by faith even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time that she considered him faithful who had promised. Now when Sarah first heard the news, she wasn't quite as sure about it. But apparently she came around to believing that she conceived because God had blessed her, given her the ability to conceive. Verse 12, Therefore there was born even to one man and him as good as dead at that, as many descendants as the stars in heaven in number, and innumerable as the sand by which is by the seashore. Now that verse used to always bother me too. Because you could, we could count the descendants of Abraham. And come fairly close. We can't get an exact number. We can come fairly close. And how can they be as innumerable as the stars of heaven, which we can't count, 
or the sand by the seashore, which we also cannot count. But see, Galatians 3, verse 7 explains it. Oh, I'm sorry. Therefore, be sure that those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. That's what's being talked about. As you, it is impossible for us to count the stars in the heavens. It is impossible for us to count the sand by the seashore. It is impossible for us to count those that belong to our Lord and Savior. Talking about a number is talking about the impossibility to know the number. Because the children of Abraham are all believers throughout all of history. All these died in faith without receiving the great line. The promises that were earthly, they didn't receive. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, having faith that the promises were still being fulfilled, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles here on earth. But see, all of that was a foreshadow again, like we talked about last week. That was the foreshadow of the coming of the earth from the earthly way of seeing it to the heavenly way of seeing it. Here we're going back into the way back into the Old Testament and talking about people going back before the flood, shortly after the flood, and these people were also looking for that promised land, but that promised land they knew wasn't dirt. It was heaven. It was fellowship with God Almighty. And having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, in other words, it's not here. It's there. Back to verse 1. After all we looked at, verse 1 becomes more relevant. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Do you see how much stronger it is now than we looked at it being a chair and a check and a deposit? How it was so simple and now we can see it how it's so profound. Be simply because of the fact we understand more about it. We've seen the faithfulness of our God in the midst of what we've looked at, going way, way back. And he's never, ever failed. And there's been times in the history of this planet when it looked like Satan won and hope is gone. But if we can look back and we see how rotten it is out there in this world today, it isn't even close to what it was. We need not worry about that. But we need to be concerned about those that don't know. And this is our responsibility. This is a demonstration of our faith. Is by what do we do with it? Do we actually share that faith with people? Do we actually go out in our daily lives and the people that we meet and do we share that faith? And this is something that I personally have had great opportunities to do, and I have failed miserably at it at the same time. When I've had opportunities and not really taken advantage of them because, you know, you, well, I'm not sure I should say something or not, you know, this mindset. And I pray that I get stronger in that um, because this is such a great story. And it's not a story that isn't based upon truth because it is truth. So come, please stand and sing. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, his name was called Emmanuel, God with us, revealed in us. His name was called Emmanuel. 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 His name was called Emmanuel. Ah, with us revealed in us his name was called Emmanuel. Lord again we come to the close of this part of the service but Lord it is not the end it's the beginning of the rest of what you have for us today 
It's also what you have for the rest of our lives. Lord, may we stand on this faith. May that faith grow and be stronger and stronger, knowing that you are a faithful God, that you have never failed your people, and you never will. For we have full assurance, because you have revealed to us, Emmanuel, God with us. Be with us now with the rest of the service, with the Bible study time, and the 11 o'clock service, Lord. We just pray that we continue to learn, we continue to grow. But that we take this out into this world that so desperately needs Jesus. In whose name we pray, amen.